Um, we are continuing our series in the book of Mark this morning. I don't know about you, but I've loved going through this book slowly and really digging into what this book is about, to really digging into what Jesus said, what he did. Um, and we have the privilege of hearing from our friend Patrick McDonald this morning. So um, would you welcome Patrick up with me? <clears throat> Patrick is a teacher at Valley Christian, and um, as the school year just got started, we're, just, we're gonna take an opportunity um, to pray over anybody who's a teacher or an educator or an administrator, any, any role within education. So we get this opportunity to pray for Patrick, but if you are in education, would you mind standing? Anyone out there in education? I know, they're, I know you're out there, thank you. Can, can we, thank, the, can we ta thank all these people? You, you got to stay standing. You got to stay standing. So I would love to just pray over you. you. You are all on the front lines in so many ways. We thank you for that. We're grateful for the ways that you serve. Um, and so if you are not an educator, if you're sitting, would you just kind of reach your hand out towards somebody who's standing around you as your way of just supporting and aligning in prayer? And let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for these men and women who have given their lives to teach the upcoming generations. We know your heart for kids and we know how much you care for them. So Father, thank you for giving these people your heart for them too. We pray your protection over these teachers physically, spiritually, and emotionally as they step into classrooms and offices. And in some cases, places that are full of competing ideas. Some of those ideas opposing you even. Father, we pray in an ever-changing culture that they would be your ambassadors, being bearers of truth and love. Father, we pray you would open their hearts and eyes to those kids who need extra love and extra support. And God, would you grant them patience? Would you give them rest when their souls are weary? Would you fill them and therefore their classrooms and offices with your joy and your peace? And would you use these men and women to impact the hearts and minds of generations to come? We're grateful for them and we ask your blessing over each one of them and their families. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you thank our teachers and educators one more time? If you have your Bibles, would you grab those, open them up, and turn to Mark chapter 6? And um, Patrick? Thank you. Um, so a few days ago, Nike released the jerseys for the U.S. men's national team that they'll be wearing in the World Cup this fall. Um, and every time they do something like this, it reminds me of one of my biggest regrets in life, um, which took place on March 24th, 2017. And on that day, not too far from here, over at Avaya Stadium, the U.S. men's team was playing a World Cup qualifying match. I had never seen them in person. That's a pretty big deal. Um, for those of you who know my dad, he loves soccer. He was my soccer coach, my brother's coach growing up. And this date also happens to be like one week before his birthday. And I thought, this is the perfect gift. I'm going to get my dad tickets, and I'm going to take him to this soccer game. And it's going to be amazing. And then I looked at the prices, and I thought, I don't know if we're going to this game. Right? My brain kind of took over, and it, it overrode my heart and my emotions and just kind of shoved them down. I don't know if any of you also cope with life that way sometimes. Um, I don't wanna blame my parent who is an accountant, but I also don't wanna be fully responsible for this decision. <laughs> so we didn't go to the game, right? The, 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 the only tickets that I could maybe consider affording were way too expensive, in the nosebleeds. Then I found out, oh, it's going to rain. Okay, that's fine. Like, I, I dodged a bullet here. Um, check my phone to see how the score is. Oh, they're up one nothing, two nothing, three nothing. End of the game, U.S. wins six to zero on their way to qualifying for the World Cup. And I could have been there. And I could have been there with my dad and cemented my status as his favorite child for the rest of his life, <laughs> right? And we're laughing because we all know that, I mean, that would be pretty true, that would be a pretty great gift. Um, and when I look back on this, yeah, this was not some like, I don't lose sleep at night. 
anymore. But I did have an opportunity that I missed out on. And it would have been something that I would have remembered for the rest of my life, right? Because this is a once in a lifetime type opportunity that this team was playing in a meaningful game so close to home. But I missed out. And today we're gonna read a story about a bunch of people who missed out. And they missed out on something a whole lot more important uh, than one soccer game. Now, as we've been reading through Mark, we've been going slow, but there's been a lot that's been happening. Right, Mark's been taking us on a journey. And he kind of wrote this book in a, kind of the style of like a historical biography back then. Um, the way the gospels were written, it's very similar to how someone would have written a book about one of the Caesars. Where, yeah, there's historical facts in here. We're telling things that are true, but there's a purpose behind it. Because we want to tell a story. We want to make a point. And we want to make clear not just things that happened or tell us information about somebody, but we want to explain his purpose, his mission, his goals. And Mark starts off very clearly in, in chapter one, the very first verse when he writes, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Right? This is what this story is going to be about. Right? He connects Jesus to Old Testament prophecies. He talks about Jesus getting baptized. God speaks from the heavens. This is my son. Like, and that's just in the first few paragraphs. Right? Then Jesus drives out some impure spirits. He heals a man with leprosy. He heals a paralyzed man and forgives him of his sins. Then he goes and eats with some sinners. Wild times. He heals on the Sabbath. All right? That upset some of the religious leaders. That's not how it was supposed to work back then. Crowds started following Jesus. People start accusing him. He tells some stories about his kingdom. Right? We read through all these different parables where he's kind of explaining, here's who I am, here's what God is like, and here is the kingdom that I am bringing. Then Jesus casually calms a storm. <laughs> and last week, we read about how he healed two different people. Right, the first one was a woman who came up to him and just touched his clothing. And just think about that for a moment. Because to us, that sounds kind of superstitious. But it worked and she was healed. And then just because we needed to do something even more impressive, right afterwards he goes and he raises a girl back from the dead. Like there's nothing he can't do. He's doing it all and he's doing it repeatedly. And Mark is making it clear, this is who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. He is everything you had hoped for. He is everything you've been waiting for. And he has come to change the world. He has the authority of God because he's been sent and anointed by God. And now we get to chapter six and Jesus is gonna go to his hometown. And what would we expect Right? Shouldn't he be the greatest celebrity this town has ever seen? And in this type of a story, especially if you look at the way that other kind of biographies were written back then, right? this would be a big deal. He would receive a hero's welcome. People would just be pumped to see him. They would be dropping everything. And so Mark writes here in chapter six, starting in verse one, says, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, 
he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Right? So he goes to the synagogue, which was kind of like their church at the time, and he goes to teach, and people are amazed and impressed. And they start with some questions, we read. Well, they said, where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? So in the beginning, it sounds like people are pretty excited, right? And the way these questions are phrased, um, it's likely very open-ended. Like there were probably people there who were thinking like, this might be a big deal. Like we haven't heard someone like this before. We've heard about him. We know the things that he's done. We know that there's these followers and these crowds and he's brought his disciples with him. Where did this come from? What is, what is happening? But then it takes a little bit of a turn in verse three where Mark writes, the people were saying, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So they're no longer impressed. They're offended. There's something about Jesus that they don't like. There's something about his message or his identity that they don't approve of. So Jesus responds and said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives and in his home. He could not do any miracles there. Did I read that right? He could not do any miracles there. except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. We just read for five chapters about amazing things that Jesus has done. Amazing things that no one else could possibly do. We've seen people experience the life-changing power that Jesus brings. And now we get to a place that missed out. They took offense at Jesus. They questioned his identity. They doubted him. And it says he could not do any miracles there and he was amazed at their lack of faith. Jesus' hometown missed out on an opportunity for God to transform their community. They missed out on an opportunity to see miracles. They missed out on an opportunity to have their lives changed. I think we can miss out on opportunities as well. I think we miss out on God's presence when we take Jesus for granted, just like his hometown took him for granted. We get too comfortable or too familiar. We go through the motions. Maybe it feels a little bit numb. Maybe we don't expect anything to happen. And usually when we don't expect anything to happen, nothing does. Now I wanna spend a few minutes looking at the last few verses. Because they're key to this story. And I think it's off, there's also some, some traps we can fall into or some assumptions we can make that can lead us astray a little bit. Right, and as we're reading this, right, we've seen so many people in Mark who respond positively to Jesus' message. And at the beginning of this passage, we, we, we hear people who seem like at least 
neutral or open to Jesus' message. And then it takes a bit of a turn. And in narrative portions of Scripture, authors like Mark do this kind of stuff on purpose because they want us to notice, they want us to pay attention, and he wants us to focus in on the point. And not only do people start to doubt him, but then in verse 5, which I read twice already, he, which is Jesus, he could not do any miracles there. Didn't we just read about like a bunch of miracles? <laughs> Doesn't it seem like Jesus can do anything? I mean, death did not stop him from raising a girl back to life. And yet one paragraph later, Mark says, he could not do any miracles there. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. And so in this story, we see that this community missed out on Jesus' presence. They missed out on God's power because they didn't believe. Now in this translation, it says Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. But what does that mean exactly? Like what is Mark trying to say? Right, this isn't word for word what Jesus spoke. This is Mark narrating the story about what happened. And the way he records it is that Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. All right, now I read that, and if you're like me, you're like, I, I don't want to end up that way. Like, how can I avoid whatever went on, whatever happened? So I think it's important to point out a few things. And one, this doesn't seem to be addressing, like, one particular individual. Right? It's not like the story went about where Jesus was healing a bunch of people and one person came forward and said, Jesus, please heal me. And he was like, not enough faith. Like, next in line. No, there was clearly a lack of miraculous work among the whole community. Because as a whole, they lacked faith. And as a whole, they missed out. They could have known this is who they were waiting for. But they didn't believe Jesus was who he said he was. And I would just add too, while the NIV, which is the translation I'm reading from, says he was amazed at their lack of faith, I do prefer the way a number of other translations use this word, right? So if you have an ESV or an NASB or a few, or a few others, that will read, he was amazed at their unbelief. And I think this is a better word in English. It's just a little clunky, right? When's the last time you used the phrase or heard the phrase unbelief? I have sometimes, but it's always with the other theology nerds, right? Like it's not like common 21st century English vernacular. And that's why I like this translation as a whole, because I think, it, I think it's the clearest and the easiest to read, especially if you don't come from a church background. But in this case, I think the term unbelief is more clear, especially with the context of this passage. Because in the Greek, I mean, even in the English, it's fairly clear, belief and unbelief, right? They're, they're polar opposites. I don't think we think about faith that way all the time. And what has Mark said in all of these stories we've read so far, like why have people been healed? 
And I am gonna, I am gonna stretch for some audience participation on this actual question. It is a one word answer. What did Mark say about the people who were healed? Jesus commented about their faith, yeah. And here, he's using a word that's showing the exact opposite of everybody else who had been healed. Which we could see belief and unbelief. So all these people who were healed, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. At least to the best of their understanding and their ability. And here, people looked at him and said, no. <laughs> Like, we, we know who you are. You're the carpenter's son. You're the son of Mary. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And I think it's important to emphasize this because when we use the term faith, especially in our spiritual lives, like, I think we often talk about it as if there's sort of this sliding scale, right? Where you can have more faith or less faith, right? Maybe sometimes we might even say like our faith could be hot or cold or lukewarm, right? We often use phrases like, you know, we might talk about who's, who's ever heard the phrase, you know, someone being really on fire for God or this person's really on fire for Jesus right now, right? And what we're expressing is that there's some level of like passion and emotion that we can visibly see in someone's life that is, provides some sort of evidence for maybe a strong faith. And I think the reality is too that we don't always feel like we are firing on all cylinders. And if we were to rate our level of faith on a scale of one to 10, um, I don't know how often we'd be in the tens or nines or eights. I don't want to keep going lower. I'll just start to feel bad. <laughs> right? But we all have those moments where we doubt or we question or we wonder. And it's easy to start to feel disappointed or ashamed. Like it's our fault that something isn't happening. It's our fault God isn't answering my prayer. Or we can feel like maybe if I was a better Christian, God would heal me of something or God would heal a friend of mine and we can spiral and we can become discouraged. But I don't think that's what's happening in our passage. Because when we look at the way that the people treated Jesus, right, isn't this the carpenter? Like, he's not special. He's just like us. <laughs> you know, aren't these his brothers? Aren't his sisters with us? Like, he is just a normal human, just like you and me. How could he be the son of God? And if you're paying close attention, you're thinking, why did he skip over, isn't this Mary's son? Well, I saved the best for last, or kind of the worst for last in this case. Right, because back then, identity meant everything. Your value and your worth and your honor <clears throat> meant a lot. <clears throat> and so a lot of times, right, your honor came from your family specifically your father. So what are they saying about Jesus right here? Right? It's a not so subtle, passive aggressive comment. Like we don't actually know who your dad is, Jesus. You're not like us. You're not as good as us. Like that's what that type of comment can be communicating. Is instead of recognizing that as Mark said, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. They're saying he's just a normal person. He's no better than me and you. He's not special. 
And that's why they missed out, because they rejected him. They took offense at him. This wasn't a group of people who was struggling to believe or wanting to believe or trying to believe. They outright said no. And so when Mark says Jesus could not do any miracles there, that's why. Because they rejected him. Now it's also interesting to note that in the second half of verse five, right? Jesus could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. No miracles, but there were a few healings, FYI. And I think too, this is important because we see there must have been people in this community who did believe. Everything we've read in these stories so far is people being healed when they have faith. People being healed when they believe that Jesus has the ability and the authority, when they believe that he came from God. So it must be that there were people there who did believe. And that's where we see kind of Jesus or Mark kind of addressing the individual. And a lot of the stories that Mark talks about, and it's this way in, in other gospels as well, right? We get a story that Mark focuses on, a big healing, and then it'll, he'll end it with something like, and Jesus stayed there a few more days and healed a bunch of people. He cast out some evil spirits or he healed everyone who was brought to, them, to him or people brought, came from all over the town or brought the sick to be healed. So everything that we've been experiencing and reading about in the past is a big deal. There's a large volume of miracles, it seems like. And here it's just a small kind of footnote in the passage because some people did believe and God honored them. And I believe Jesus here is addressing that the community had a lack of faith. He didn't stay long. He didn't do much. He could have healed every single person there. No doubt. He had the ability. He had the heart. But the people didn't want him. And that's why I think it's important to pay attention to some of these details. To make sure we understand clearly what, what Mark wants us to come away with, what's true about Jesus, what's true about the way he interacts with us. Because it would be easy to wonder if it was our fault that Jesus didn't answer a prayer the way we were hoping. It would be easy to wonder, maybe I don't trust enough, maybe I don't have enough faith, and that's why I'm failing. But we see that Jesus healed people there, and in a few weeks we'll read a story that I think is helpful in this context in Mark 9. Um, the disciples bring a dad and his son to Jesus. And the son's possessed by an evil spirit. They can't cast him out. And they ask Jesus to help. Um, and the father asks him, he says, Jesus, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help. And Jesus replies, if you can, Everything is possible for one who believes. And the father responds with, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And so Jesus heals the boy. I think that's the heart of God. That's the heart of Jesus right there. If we don't feel like we have enough faith, we can ask him to give us more, to give us enough 
if we're viewing it from this like sliding scale of one to 10, and we want to be a few higher, we can ask. And I think too that there are ways that we can live and posture our lives to make it, to make us more open and receptive to seeing God and hearing from God. Because on the one hand, the people missed out because they rejected Jesus. And it's very true that the gospel message says the only way to have a relationship with God is if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, who died and rose again for the forgiveness of your sins. And so if we don't believe that that is true, we miss out on a lot. But I also think there's a section here that applies a little more specifically uh, to those of us who do believe that Jesus is who he said he is. And that is in Jesus' response in verse four, when he says, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives and in his home. Right? The people who are familiar with him can take him for granted. And I think that's the danger for those of us who are believers that we can run into. And we miss out on God's presence when we take Jesus for granted. We miss out when we go through the motions, right? It's easy to become complacent because Jesus is familiar or things in life get in the way. And there's a few things that come to mind for me, either from my own life or from things that I think I see. And first, kind of in our like our individual lives, our personal relationship with God, it's easy to become complacent. Especially in prayer and reading scripture. I think those are kind of the two primary ways that we, we connect with God on an individual basis. Right. And how often, how easy is it to pray kind of the same prayer every time? Or to pray before dinner because it's a, a good thing to do and kind of pray without really thinking about the words. Because on the one hand, you know, and maybe everybody's hungry, you've got young kids, don't say a super long prayer. But there's a difference between saying, God's neat, let's eat, There's a difference between that and realizing that the book of Hebrews says, because Jesus, as our high priest, died and rose again, we now can enter before God in his throne room and pray directly to him. Something that was not possible for humans before Jesus. And I'll be honest, I don't think about that every time that I pray. I don't even want to say how little I think about that before I pray. But that's the reality of the gift that God has given us. He's created us with meaning. He's created us with purpose. He's created us to have a relationship with him. And he's made it possible for us on an individual basis to commune with him, to speak with him and to hear from him. And if we're being honest, like that should blow our minds. That should be life changing. And sometimes it absolutely is, but it's also easy to forget. It's easy to go through the motions. It's easy to become complacent. I think too, it's really easy to become complacent on Sundays.
it's easy to go through the motions at church. Maybe we're singing the same worship song we've heard a bunch of times. Maybe it's a song we really like, but we've sang it so many times we're not even really thinking about the words and we're just kind of here. Maybe it's a song we've never heard before and we're not really in the mood to learn something new. Right? I've been there. I remember being at a church um, when I was in seminary and there were things that I loved about that church community. I rarely liked the worship songs, just being transparent. And you know, I remember one time, I don't remember exactly when it was, um, but I remember saying something to Amy and I was like, ugh, they did those songs again. And at some point, I remember God was like, what makes you think this is about you? And I was like, oh, you're right. You know, what makes you think that the songs that we're singing have anything to do with like how you feel about them? And I had to sit and think for a moment and reflect like, what, what, what is it supposed to be about? It's supposed to be about joining together with other believers and worshiping the God who saved me from my sin. Something that I should be thankful for every moment of every day. Because I could have been destined for eternity apart from him, but instead he has provided a way that not only do I get to spend eternity with him, but I get to experience a deep, meaningful relationship with him today. And enables me to have deeper, more meaningful relationships with my family, with my friends, and with other believers. And the reality is, there were plenty of songs that I missed out on during those worship services. But it doesn't just stop there, right? Because if I'm in a bad mood after church about a song, well, it probably means I was in a grumpy mood during the sermon and not really wanting to listen. So now I'm missing out even more. And then that can trickle into, do I even want to go to church next week? Right? And I do think, I shouldn't say I think, Scripture is clear that God intends for us to gather together regularly as His people. Because we need to be spiritually present as a community and as a church. And this is really just about putting ourselves in a position to be a part of God's movement. Putting ourselves in a position to be transformed by him. Living a life where we are available to be used by God for his kingdom. It's not about us making sure God does something. It's about being in a position where we are willing, where we are likely to hear from him, where we are likely to sense what he is doing, and we are likely to obey. So we need to be devoted, we need to be devoted to God and to his family. So individually, when it comes to things like prayer, things like reading scripture, we have to make the time. Don't try and find the time. I never find the time. We have to make the time. And when, we're, when we come to church, we get to be a part of God's family. God's spiritual family. And that's been important since the earliest writings in the Old Testament. 
But I think it's especially clear and for me inspiring in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, which is where we kind of read about the beginning of the early church. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. He talks to his disciples for a bit. And then he ascends into heaven. He kind of gives them instructions on what to do. And here's, here's what Acts 2, uh, 42 says. Talking about the early believers, the early Christians. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Then everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. And then later down it says, and the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. And there's something about being part of a physical community that is significant. And I know speaking from experience, the blessings of the internet and being able to watch a recording or watch online live can make it more tempting for me to sleep in. And not go to church. Because there's an, there's an alternative, there's an option that might feel easier. But I know deep down that's not what's best for me, that's not what's best for my family. Because there's something significant about gathering in the presence of believers when we worship together and we hear people around us singing the same songs that we're singing, worshiping the same God that we're worshiping. There's something about the rhythm of setting aside one day a week where we're a little more dedicated or focused on God. Not in a check the box kind of sense, like I did my duty, not in a, well, this will help me get through another week and be a little bit of a better person. But it's partly so we just don't forget <laughs> who God is and what he's done for us. I want to say something as we close directed a little more specifically to dads especially if you have young kids or kids who still live at home there is nothing more beautiful and joyful and life giving than seeing our kids grow up to know Jesus to participate at church to see their lives changed. But as dads, your kids need you. They need you to lead by example. And some of this is like data from studies and surveys, which has been consistent for like 50 years now. And I don't think it's gonna change anytime soon. That when dads go to church, and when they bring their family with them, their kids grow up to know Jesus. When dads pray with their kids at home, when dad reads the Bible with their kids, their kids are more likely to grow up in the faith, to know who Jesus is, to understand his identity and his power. doesn't guarantee anything. None of us can guarantee anything. But I can tell you from personal experience, in my own life, having a dad and a grandpa who were very dedicated to the faith, the role it played for me, uh, the role it played for my mom, I've seen it in the lives of my friends and their kids. And I've read about it in 
in too many studies. And the reality is, look at the church nationwide, worldwide, there's not a lack of women or moms showing up. There's not a lack of women serving or bringing kids on Sundays. But we don't have enough men and we don't have enough dads who take this seriously. And so to the dads who are here, and I'm speaking to myself in many ways, what I want us to leave with is to know the difference that you make in the spiritual lives of your family and the difference that you make in the spiritual life of this community, our church, Calvary. And just do your best. There's not this like crazy high bar we have to clear. But just let your kids see what it looks like to love and follow God. Let them see it at home and let them see it here. And our community will be a better place because of it. And to all of us, you know, what can you do to make yourself available to God today or this week in ways that you maybe haven't in the past? What's a change that you can make? Even if it's something small. If you're like, I haven't read my Bible in months, read a couple of verses tomorrow. <laughs> like, that's a start. Again, it doesn't have to be a big thing. And I would just say, if you're thinking about them, just choose one. If you've got a dozen ideas, write them down. Maybe choose the easiest and go for it. Because we want to start somewhere. And I guarantee you, you don't want to miss out. We're going to come to a time now, um, opportunity to reflect. I would encourage you to either sit silently or to pray. Maybe ask that God would speak to you just think what can I do to make myself more available to God what can I do to make myself more aware of the way that God is working in my life or working in my community